This is your complete beginner's guide to the DJI Air 3 drone. From start to finish, I'm gonna take you through all the parts in the box, how to get it up in the air, the basics of flying, obstacle avoidance, video and photo modes, active track, advanced modes, all the new features of the Air 3, and tons of tips and tricks over the next 45 or so minutes. You can use the YouTube chapters along the bottom down there to go ahead and find the section you're most interested in. For example, if you're a more experienced flyer, you can skip beyond the takeoff and get to some of the advanced features of the Air 3. Now, I've got quite a bit of experience with drones, more than a decade at this point, and flying them and pushing them to the limits. So I'm gonna give you tons of quick tips and practical things along the way. And in the case of the Air 3 in particular, I'm gonna talk about what works well and some of the things you might need to be aware of. Okay, so with all that out of the way, the very first decision you need to make when you're buying this drone, uh, if you haven't bought it already, is to go ahead and decide which controller to get. You have basically two options. Not basically, you only have two options at this point. Uh, you have the DJI RC2, uh, which is the one that has a screen built into it. Uh, basically, it's self-contained. So everything you need to fly the drone is on this little controller right here. Or you have the DJI RC N2. Note that all past DJI controllers are not compatible with the Air 3. Now, as I said, the most obvious difference is the fact that the RC2 has a screen built into it, uh, so it's self-contained. Uh, also, on the back, you do have two additional custom buttons that you don't have on this controller here. Beyond that, functionality-wise, they are basically identical across the board. My personal preference is going with the RC or now the RC2, primarily because I do a lot of outdoor stuff, and when I go somewhere, I want to know that the controller and the drone are just going to work as is. I don't have to depend on the battery of my phone, nor whether or not my phone has decided to like offload the apps or something like that, or that I update it right. Like this is just a self-contained functional package. On the flip side, the one benefit to using your phone and this controller is that when you're done with the flight, you will have low resolution, not high resolution, but low resolution copies of all your photos and videos already on your phone. Uh, versus with this one here, if I wanna get them with my phone for social sharing, I gotta download them. But honestly, you gotta download them anyways if you want the high res stuff, and that's why you bought a thousand dollar drone. So it's kind of a wash in that sense. Now, after that choice is made, the next thing you gotta decide is whether or not you want the fly more combo. Uh, now, in my general rule in life is that combos are just basically unnecessary upsells. However, for DJI's drones, that's like one of the few exceptions. In the combo package, you essentially get uh, an extra carrying case bag. I'll show that on the screen right now. You get the drone, of course, but you get this battery pack, this charging station right here with two extra batteries. You also get some extra props, uh, but again, it's really about the batteries here. Uh, and if you're looking at getting extra batteries, just buy the combo and don't think anything of it. The way this works is that you have three battery slots in there. Uh, so I can press the button in the back here, pull them out like this, uh, and it will charge these sequentially. That's the one downside. Uh, so it will not charge them concurrently. You plug a 90 watt charger in there, ideally, but it can be slower, it's not a big deal. Uh, and 90 watts, it'll take one hour per battery. Uh, but what's cool is on the side there, there's a USB port, not only for charging this, but also other things. You can plug in other things and basically turn this into one giant ass battery bank or you can double tap this button right here and this will go ahead and rebalance the batteries. So what it'll do is if you have three batteries that are like 30-ish percent full, it'll combine those into one battery that's totally full, which is way more useful from a safety flying standpoint to have one full battery than three batteries at 30%. Now, battery-wise, DJI claims 46 minutes of flying time for their drones. Uh, real talk here, that's like 30 to 35 minutes. Uh, 46 minutes is if you're flying without actually recording anything uh, in, in relatively still conditions. Uh, more than likely, you'll have a little bit of wind like today, and you're probably gonna be recording something because that's, again, why you bought a $1,000 drone. Now, if you don't buy the Fly Combo Kit, no big deal. You can still plug in the USB port on the back here, USB-C port, right into the back of the drone uh, and charge it up that way. With that said, let's go ahead and talk about getting this thing in the air. The first thing you need to do is to go ahead and take one of these batteries right here. So press the button to unlock it. These are locked, otherwise they're not gonna fall out or anything like that. Uh, and we will go ahead and put it in the back of the drone. Uh, so it basically slides in like this and you'll hear it, not like that, but like this, and you'll hear a click there. Uh, there is a button on the back of the battery to see the battery state. So you see the four little dots, that means the battery is full. Uh, from there, we'll go ahead and swing out the arms. Uh, so basically you go like this, they just simply open up, makes it a lot easier to travel with it. And then on the front, we have the gimbal. Uh, the gimbal has a gimbal protector around it. Always, always, always use the gimbal protector when you're traveling with your drone. Uh, think of the gimbal a little bit like a flower, uh, in the sense that a flower lives just fine when it's out doing its own thing and there's air blowing against it, no problems like that. Uh, and you can touch the gimbal, no problem like this, as long as it's powered off. 
do not under any circumstances uh, fiddle or touch the gimbal while the drone is powered on. That will eventually break your gimbal. Uh, there's some safeguards in place where if it feels tension, it'll stop and stuff like that, like if you were to crash. Uh, but as a general rule of thumb, do not touch the gimbal while the drone is powered on. Now from a sensor standpoint, one of the big advantages of the Air 3 over something like the Mini 3 Pro series is the obstacle avoidance sensors. While the Mini 3 Pro does have obstacle avoidance sensors for forward detection, uh, it lacks the ones on the side or effectively on the top as well. Uh, here, the way this works is there's two sets of sensors, one right here in the back, or two sets right there on the back, or one set, two, you get the point, uh, and then two in the front. And these form a 360 degree circle with some additional sensors on the bottom. These are primarily ground detection sensors uh, that can go ahead and see the ground, detect how close it is. Uh, so when it comes in for landing, it does, doesn't like slam into the ground, but comes in nice and slow. But the reason these sensors are set off at an angle and not facing straight forward is so they can get this kind of 360 degree bubble around the drone and keep you from running into things. And I'm going to show you trying to run into things and how that works in just a moment. The last thing to note is that there's two different types of props. Uh, on the bags that come in the drone, it'll say A and B. Uh, but the main thing is that there's ones that have a tiny little bit of gray on there and ones that have a tiny little bit of black on there. Uh, and these keep you from putting the wrong sets of props on the wrong wings. Uh, they have to match up to what's going on on the underside of the prop there. General rule of thumb is I always like to keep one extra full set of props in my uh, drone bag at all times, uh, just because you never know what's going to happen. Uh, think of props as mostly disposable. Throw away cracked props because uh, they cause vibrations in the drone and you don't want that. So let's get this powered on and up in the air. Uh, to power on the drone, we're just going to press this button once and let go and then long hold it. So I'll press it like this and then long hold it and you'll see it goes up to the top and you'll see it starts kind of jiggling and then you'll hear a sound and then from there this gimbal will kind of wake up and eventually it'll stabilize itself nice and flat. So then the next piece is the controller. I'm going to use a DJI RC2 for all the demos today. Uh, so anytime you see the screen recording, I'm recording it on the screen here. The one downside of that is the screen recording maximum on this is 720p, a little bit lower resolution. That doesn't impact the drone's recording, that's still 4K and all that goodness, but uh, just so you're aware of that. Uh, I've also got this carabiner on the bottom right here just because I can uh, grab it if I'm cycling. I'll show you that a little later on. Uh, but the way this works to turn on is the exact same as uh, the drone. So you press the power button once and then long press it again and it turns on. You want to fold up the antennas. So go ahead and just uh, get them all folded up. There you go, like that, pretty straightforward. Uh, I'm gonna go put this on the ground in the only spot that I have that's decent right now. Now, generally speaking, this wouldn't be the best place for a beginner to take off a drone, but it's the only place I got out here. This path isn't very wide. Uh, and what I wanna ensure is it's not gonna hit anything when it takes off. Uh, the grass like this isn't ideal to hit, but it's not the end of the world. There are two types of services you wanna avoid taking off. Number one is sand. Sand is the enemy of your drone. If you've got sand in your drone, you're frankly better off having water in your drone. So uh, just do not take off on the beach. If you have to, put it on a blanket, hold it in your hand, all that kind of stuff. Just We'll talk about that later on, uh, but do not take off on the sand or land on the sand. Uh, the second surface is metal. Do not try to take off on the hood of your car or a metal sewer grate or anything like that uh, because that will mess up the compasses and it'll actually give you a warning about that, but just be aware of those two things. Now, after that, there's two things you should double check on the drone before you take off. And what you do is you tap that little dot, dot, dot menu in the upper right-hand corner there, and you want to validate that obstacle avoidance is currently set to either bypass or break. Again, we'll talk about obstacle avoidance in a second, but basically bypass means it's going to go around something, break means it's going to stop for something. Off means you're going to crash your drone and lose it. So double check that setting right there. Uh, the next thing to go ahead and double check if you slide down even further on is these three auto RTH altitude. So RTH is return to home. It's as simple as that, nothing fancy about that. Auto means automatic. So automatic return to home altitude. Meaning if something goes wrong and it's gonna automatically return to home, what altitude should it go at? Uh, and I prefer 100 meters, uh, which is basically, you know, 300 or so feet. Uh, so it's gonna get above pretty much any tree or object around here. It should go around if you wanna minimize the chance of that happening. The next two ones you want to ensure are max altitude and max distance. Uh, so max distance, I actually prefer to have it a little bit closer. I'm not sure why that was set to no limit, but I'm going to bring that down to, I don't know, something like 2,000 meters, 3,000 meters, somewhere in that range. Well beyond what I want to actually fly it at, uh, but that prevents any sort of weird flyaways from happening. Max altitude is, from a legal standpoint, uh, 120 meters. Note that if you are flying from a moving object, like a car, a boat, etc., then you should set your max distance to probably unlimited, because the max distance is based on your takeoff point unless you update the home point and we might talk about that later on if I remember uh, but the point being that if you go somewhere and you're flying along on a boat or a car for miles you go beyond this distance your 
drone will then return to the starting point and it's just a mess to deal with. Okay, up at the top on the menu there, you see a couple things. Uh, starting off with that 98, that's the battery percentage, 98% left. Next to that is the time remaining of said battery. Uh, then next to that is the RC strength, signal strength between the remote controller and the drone. Next to that is whether or not the obstacle avoidance is enabled. Uh, you will not see that being enabled until we get up in the air, so right now it's red. Following that is the satellites, 27 satellites, good deal. Don't take off with less than 13 satellites, it's a general rule of thumb. Uh, it'll basically be like orange or whatever below 13, so you don't have to worry about that. And then the whole right side is all video and photo stuff uh, that we're gonna get to later on. Down the bottom left there, uh, that is speed and distance stuff that again, I'll show you once we're in the air. With that, we're gonna go ahead and get this thing finally in the air. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see that little takeoff button right there. We're just gonna tap that once, that brings up the takeoff menu, and then you can long hold this, and up it's gonna go. This is very, very simple. It's gonna take itself up, uh, up to about a meter and a half or so, and it's just gonna hang out there. So you can see it's hanging out right there. I'm gonna rotate it around, because I wanna show you something in the wind. There we go, just gonna rotate it for a second and then go up a little bit. And what you're gonna notice right away uh, is the fact that you're probably hearing that beeping, that's because I'm too close to it from an obstacle avoidance sensor standpoint. Uh, but you'll see that the drone looks a little bit tilty. That's because of the slight bit of wind that we have right now. But the gimbal is actually perfectly straight. Uh, now, I'm gonna get this a little bit further up in the air out of the way, just so we can have a conversation here. Rule of thumb, uh, I recommend as soon as you get the drone in the air, get it at least a couple human heights worth of distance and elevation away from you, uh, just because it gives you space and no one's gonna run into it or things like that. Okay, so with the drone set, I'm gonna use my hand in a little hat camera clip here, the first time I've ever had a use for this, uh, to show you some of the controller moves and then we'll just get into like all the, the features. Uh, now I'm not gonna go super deep on this. You're gonna wanna practice like an open football field or some sort of large field uh, to get a good feel for it. Uh, basically though, your left hand stick right here is gonna control two different things. The first is gonna control rotating the entire aircraft as if it's on a pivot. So if I go left like this, you'll see the whole thing just simply turns around, uh, staying stationary in one spot. The same is true if I go right, it turns the other direction. The drone is physically staying above the exact same little bush. Uh, it's just rotating like this left and right. Uh, the next bit here is to move left and right. So this stick over here, I go ahead and I can just simply move like this. It's gonna move left and then I go like this and it's gonna move right. After that, we've got up and down. Press the left hand stick to go up like this. You'll see the drone will go up and then press it down to go down like this and you'll see the drone will go down. Lastly, we have forward and back. Press this to go forward, the right hand stick, there we go. Just go forward and then pull it back to go back. Uh, it is really as simple as that. I know this will feel complex the first couple times you do this, uh, but eventually you get the hang of it. Uh, and this allows you to then, for example, go up and forward like this. There we go, and now we're moving around that way. So there are a few more buttons on the phone of the controller that are worthwhile noting. Uh, this one right here was of course our power button. In the middle we have the mode selector. There are three modes, cinema, normal, and sport. Cinema simply slows everything down, so it makes it if you were to hold the different controllers, uh, it'll slow everything down so it's more cinematic. Uh, normal is what we're flying in right now. And then sport mode is very, very fast, except obstacle avoidance is off. Uh, so sport, think of it as more like sporty rather than tracking sports. Uh, because yes, you can go faster, but it's not for like active track or any of the folly modes, because in that case, uh, obstacle avoidance is totally off. So that's fine if we're out in the ocean, go forth. Uh, but otherwise, don't go to sport mode unless you know what you're doing. I'll show you a little bit later on how that works. Next is the return to home button and pause button. Uh, so if I were to go ahead and press this once, it's gonna pause whatever action I'm doing. Cause I'm not flying anywhere, it's not gonna do anything. But if I was in the middle of a pre-programmed move, that would pause it immediately. Uh, useful for uh, quick shots and master shots, anything where it's automatically flying, you're like, whoa, 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 I gotta stop. Just hit that button, boom, it stops. Uh, if you're flying manually, all you need to do is let go of the controller. So to show you this right here, so if I'm doing something and I'm just confused, I feel like I'm gonna go in the water, I don't know what's happening right here, boom, just let go. Always just let go. It works out every time. All right, so with that, then if I were long hold this button right here, it'll go ahead and start returning to home. So you can see it's gonna fly to us and then go ahead and land. Uh, and it's gonna land in roughly the same spot. I say roughly because while it's generally pretty precise, uh, once it gets closer, you're gonna see what's probably gonna happen as to how precise it will be. Keeping in mind, we took off on that path. Uh, and just the side of the path is grass. So really not an ideal place to land, but I wanna show you this nonetheless. And I'm gonna use the pause button to pause it probably at the last second. So here we go. 
you'll see right now it's just over the edge of the grass, uh, so it's not quite where I want it to be. So I'm gonna go ahead and use this pause button right about now. There we go. I'm pausing and saying, no, that's not where I want it to be, uh, but it's close enough. Uh, again, return to home. If you've got to use it, great. Go ahead and get to here. Uh, for now, though, we're going to get on with more flying bits. So I'm going to take it off, move it out of the way, and get up again away from us so we can actually have a conversation. Now we can talk about some of those things on the bottom left-hand side of the screen. Uh, you see that little map icon there? Uh, if we tap on that, it shows us where we are. Uh, and I can tap on it again to go ahead and get that bigger. Uh, I've downloaded an offline map here. You can download offline maps ahead of time on Wi-Fi uh, for the region you're going to. Uh, you just go into the controller and you'll see the map option right there. If you're on your phone, the maps will come up automatically using your phone's cellular signal. Uh, and it'll show you where we've flown, that little blue line. Right now we haven't flown very far, so it's not gonna show us very much. We're gonna go back to the main uh, view there. We're gonna minimize that down by just tapping the lower left-hand corner. And then you see H, that's my height, I'm at 8.4 meters, uh, and my distance, 9.4 meters. If you want to change those to feet, for example, you tap the dot, dot, dot up in the upper right-hand corner, and then we go into control, and you'll see metric, metric kilometers, or imperial. You would just change it to imperial, and now you'll see when we get back there, I'm at 27 feet uh, and 32 feet away from me, the distance away from me right now. I'm going to go back to metric kilometers, sorry, uh, but if I move the sticks forward here, you'll see the speed goes up to uh, 20 kilometers an hour. Uh, and then if I go up, you'll see my ascent rate goes to, again, 15 or so uh, kilometers an hour for my ascent rate. So you can see those two metrics right there. So now that we've got the drone, I'm going to pull it down a little bit more. Uh, next to this tree right here, I'm going to show you obstacle avoidance. I'm going to bring my camera over there so we can see what's going on. And there is the drone to the left. I'm just going to go up and down so you can see real quick what that looks like. There we go. And you can see the tree. Now I'm going to back up a little bit. Okay. And I'm going to go straight towards the bush. Just point it straight forward and it's going to automatically fly over or around the bush depending on what it wants to do. That is the obstacle avoidance automatically happening. It's going to do one of two things. It's going to go either left or the right of it, or it's going to go over the top of it or even some combination thereof. Uh, now, if it's in a scenario where it can't go up because it detects that there is obstacles above it, uh, it'll try to go around something and eventually it'll stop and say, hey, I'm, I'm stuck in its little spot there. And the same is true if we go sideways into something. So I'm now gonna go ahead and angle it so it goes straight into these trees sideways, just like this, and watch. It's automatically going around and in front of them uh, so it does not hit the trees. And again, it's all 360 degrees all the way around. Uh, now, a couple things to note. I'm in the middle of summer right now, so everything is super green, super visible. It's bright and sunny out, uh, late morning. However, if you're flying in the winter, uh, you need to be aware that there's way less light. These are using camera sensors, not some sort of LiDAR or anything like that. Thus, uh, if it can't see the thing, uh, primarily really thin branches without leaves on it, uh, or just close to sunset, any sort of darker environment, it will crash into it. I promise you, like it's my job to crash these things. Uh, and basically I can tell you it'll crash into things. Oh, hey, a quick note from later me in the video. If you are finding this useful or interesting, Thing. If you could just hit that like or subscribe button, it really does help out this video and all of the time and effort I went into it uh, quite a bit. So with all the flying fundamentals out of the way, let's dive into some of the video modes. On the right hand side there is your control for recording something. Uh, so you see that red button there, that'll stop and start. I can press it once, that'll start recording. There we go. Uh, there's also a record button on the upper side, upper left hand side there. I can stop and start that way as well. Uh, and then the right hand side will take a picture. Uh, and we'll get to photos in just a moment as well. You'll see there is a one and a three. That's because there's two lenses on the Air 3. Uh, there's a 1X lens and a 3X lens with different focal lengths on them. Uh, and they both shoot in 4K, but at slightly different apertures. So in the case of the main lens, the 1X lens, you have better low light performance uh, than the 3X lens. It's not dramatically so though, as you'll find out. It's really only notable when you get to basically completely dark environments, but sunset and stuff like that, you can totally use either lens. Here's some like side-by-side -side footage between the two lenses, uh, and they work great. The cool part about having a dedicated lens is you're not cropping into the frame so it's still crystal clear uh, versus if you have something like the Mini 3 Pro with the single lens or the Mavic 3 Classic uh, with a single lens you are cropping into those images uh, so you're just zooming that's all you're doing just like on your phone when you pinch and zoom same thing it's not making that as clear versus the different optical lens is like switching a lens on a camera uh, so if I were to go ahead and tap that 3x right there uh, it takes a second to go ahead and engage. There we go. I'm just going to move and reorient it towards the uh, windmill. Uh, and now I'm still recording at 4K. Down the bottom there, you will see the resolutions. Uh, so you see right now it says 4K 60 uh, and plus 0.3 for the EV. 
That's because I was filming last in a case where it's a bit more, uh, a little darker. I'm gonna go back to 0.0, .0 for the EV. That's your exposure compensation. Uh, so I bump that up a little bit if I'm shooting in a darker environment uh, and I reduce it if it's brighter. Right now it's kind of slightly overcast, so that's fine. And if I tap next to that, I have uh, res and FPS. So res is of course the resolution and FPS is your frames per second. Uh, generally speaking, you're gonna shoot either 30 frames per second or 60 frames per second. The more frames per second you shoot, the, the more ability you have to slow it down. So if you talk about slow-mo, for example, which DJI puts in a different area on the controller right here. So I go back up, I tap that little film strip icon. These are the different modes. And you see that within the video mode, I have normal, night, and slow motion. So if I tap a slow-mo mode there, then the bottom, I've got more resolution options. I can tap it again. And you'll see at 1080p, I've got 100 frames per second and 200 frames per second. Generally speaking, uh, if you're broadcasting something, it'll be at 30 frames per second, which means you just divide these two and say, oh, I can slow it down three times as much at 100 frames per second, or I can slow it down, you know, roughly six, seven times as much at 200 frames per second. In the case of 4K, you can go up to 100 frames per second. You can see here these examples of these boats that I've taken in slow-mo mode or these waves, whatever I'm showing on the screen right now, uh, where I've slowed things down and gives that much more dramatic look to it. Going back to the normal mode though, we'll tap the slow option. We'll go back to normal. Uh, you'll note there are some other options there for vertical. Uh, so if I look there, you'll see 1080, uh, nine by 16. Now you'll notice on the screen, it just went to the highlighted section being the middle. Unfortunately, the Air 3 does not have the ability to rotate the entire gimbal vertical like the Mini 3 Pro does. Uh, so this means that in this case, it's just simply taking a crop. It does, though, give you a tiny bit extra resolution because of the way the sensor works. They expand up the top a tiny bit for this, uh, but it's very, very minimal. In general, I would say just shoot in landscape mode uh, unless you know you're absolutely positively only gonna use the vertical side, then get the tiny bit extra here. Uh, and this is true as well. If I go to 2.7K, uh, again, you can see just the different resolutions. Uh, also, generally speaking, shoot in the highest resolution. Again, you bought a $1,000 drone to do that. Uh, don't Friends don't let friends shoot in 1080p across the board. It's just, just not so awesome. Now, we're gonna go back to regular 4K mode there, and we're gonna shoot in 60 frames per second. There we go. Uh, and we can now go ahead and press that record button to start recording like that, which we'll do. Uh, and then on the bottom, there is the gimbal switch. So this one right here, if I rotate this, it'll go ahead and go down. So you can see the gimbal goes all the way down. I can go faster if I just pull it harder. Uh, it's gonna go all the way down to 90 degrees, pointing straight down and looking at this bike path. It's a little bit in front of us, so we're not gonna see us, uh, but I can back up and he can look at us. So I will go ahead and just uh, pull the drone back here until it's over us. Almost there. Where are we on this path? I can hear it above me. There we go. There's me and the bike. We'll talk about the bike later on. Uh, you can also use the C1 function button on the back to go ahead and change that. So if I tap this once right there, it'll go back up to flat. I tap it again, it goes straight down again. Super handy because, you know, pointing straight down is a cool drone shot. If there was some, you know, cyclist or someone that I knew that was in control of the scene uh, going along here, it is kind of a neat shot to go straight down like that. You can customize these by tapping the dot, dot, dot up there in the uh, upper right hand corner. And then you go down and you'll see button customization. And this is just for the RC uh, controller, by the way, not the one that has a phone. And you'll see the two options there, C1 button, C2 button. I tap this and then I've got different uh, features that I can use. So I can do control, I can do camera, I can do different camera settings, for example, uh, plan waypoints, etc. And you can customize these however you see fit. And the same is true for the two different dials there that you see, uh, as well as the ability to do combination of buttons too, uh, like you can see there, there as well. In addition to the gimbal going down, the gimbal also goes up. So you can go up to 60 degrees up. Uh, that is cool if you had, for example, a giant like sequoia tree or a tall skyscraper or something like that, uh, where you started at the bottom and you were pointing up towards the top. And as you rose up, you went like this. Uh, lots of interesting ways to do that. You'll find yourself being in an up gimbal position at some point and you'll be like, oh yeah, I'm an up gimbal. That's kind of cool. And it's just nice to be able to have it there. And again, tap the lower left hand button there, middle left hand button to zero it out to zero degrees or down 90, depending on which scenario you want. Also, you have the zoom option. So on the right hand side, you can zoom in and out uh, using this. So if I were to go ahead and just recenter on the windmill right there, I can go back and I can go forward. This is on the 3X zoom. Uh, you do have to stop video if you want to switch between the two physical lenses. Uh, so those are digital zooms. If I go to the 1X lens now, there we go. Uh, now I can use the same zoom as well to zoom all the way in to 3X. 
uh, and then back again. Uh, and yeah, that's a digitally cropping in and cropping out. Uh, I generally wouldn't use that. I would just crop on whatever video editing app I'm using instead versus being forced into whatever I've cropped while I was flying. Next, there are some pro options here. Uh, so I'm gonna just get this off my head so I don't have to listen to it so much. There we go, we'll go forward a little ways towards the windmill. Okay, in lower right hand side, you see where it says auto. Uh, if I tap that, I get into the pro modes. This is where I can configure all these things manually, like shooting on a manual camera. Uh, so I can tap anything here and I can say, oh, I'm gonna change the white balance. I'm gonna go from 5,500, which is daylight to this, which will look horrible, of course. I just kind of want to show you that you can do that. Uh, I can go back to auto for that. I can go down here. I can change the color profile. Uh, so I can go to normal, to HLG, to D-Log. Uh, D-Log is basically an ungraded version of this. So if I tap D-Log really quick, there we go. I'm gonna actually turn so I'm not facing the sun, so it's a little bit easier to see here. Uh, so I'm just gonna go this way, that way you can see what this looks like. Okay, lots of color on the screen, right? Really pretty, lily pads, all that kind of stuff. If I tap D-Log, it's gonna look a little bit grayer now. Uh, this allows you to color grade after the fact. Uh, if you know what I'm talking about here, then great. You'll know how to use this feature and how to use it after the fact. If you don't have any of what I'm talking about right now, don't enable this. It'll just make your life way more difficult. This gives you much more range in editing in terms of processing colors. Uh, but again, it requires a lot more work. Uh, and there's HLG, which is basically kind of a HDR kind of equivalent. And then you see above that, my storage. So on the SD card that I have in the aircraft, I've got two. 200 and, uh, 256 sig card in there. I have 18 gigs left. Uh, I use 256 sig cards. I'll link to the card I use down below. These are the cards I use across everything. Uh, they just work really well. It's like 30 or so bucks for a 256 gig card. Uh, they're amazing, definitely not sponsored. You see below that, the two recording formats, H.265, H.264. Uh, just keep it on H.265, that'll save you a bit more space. Doesn't save anything from like how it looks, it looks great. Uh, 264 is mostly for really old computers that don't support this, but if you just bought this expensive drone, uh, then likely your computer will support this just fine. A computer's back like almost eight to 10 years support uh, H.265. And then on the right hand side, if you tap that little um, circle thing, you can then change your ISO and shutter and EV comp. Uh, so ISO allows you to go ahead and manually modify that. So I can just untap auto and I can choose what I want the ISO to be at. Uh, again, these are all things you can play with later on and shutter speed and then EV comp as well is the most common one uh, to brighten up the image or darken the image if it's too bright out. Now I'm gonna turn back off auto mode just so we're kind of all in one spot here. Uh, you'll notice at the top, our battery is now down to 34%. Uh, note that it does, generally speaking, take more battery to hover than it does to fly around. Uh, so right now we've been doing a lot of hovering uh, before we get in all these moves. Uh, we're gonna talk about photo moves and then we'll probably swap batteries and get into all the automated moves and some of the good stuff here. So to switch into photo modes, you tap that right hand button where the film strip is there and you see photo. There we go. Uh, and now we have our photo menu. Single, it's just taking a single photo. I can press the button up here, boop take a photo or I can press the button on the screen and that's done. Uh, at the bottom, you'll see I have two different ways I can record this. So if I select where I say format, there is J plus raw, there's JPEG or raw. Raw is a uh, higher uh, depth uh, in terms of detail and what's recorded in it. Uh, and then JPEG plus raw is giving you both. I always shoot both because sometimes I just want a quick uh, shot to offload uh, on my camera and off I go. And sometimes I want the really high quality stuff that I can edit later on in Lightroom and have all the raw original information in the photo. So there's no technical difference in the resolutions they shoot. Uh, just to be clear on that, it's just the amount of information recorded to the file. Uh, and then you still have the EV comp option there. And to the right, you still have all of the uh, manual photo options, just like you saw on the video side. Uh, that is all there as well. I can go ahead and untap that to get back out of that. And then we go back up to that photo menu. You have AEB or auto exposure bracket. That'll essentially expose the shadows better as well as the highlights better uh, into one image. Some people don't like the look of it though, so keep that in mind. And then below that, there is burst. Uh, so again, taking a bunch of photos. Generally speaking, I don't find the burst super useful on drones or even action cameras these days because the frame rates are so high anyways that you know, you're shooting at 60 frames per second. That's way better than the burst is gonna do. So you might as well just shoot that. It's not quite as high resolution, of course, if you're shooting video, but at 4K, it's pretty darn close and you're more likely to not miss whatever it is you're trying to shoot. So uh, unless you have a lot of spare time and really, really, really want it to be uh, in a raw photo mode or something like that, don't shoot bursts, just shoot slow-mo or whatever it is that you want. And then you have time shot. Uh, this is actually one of my favorite modes, my secret favorite modes here for, oops, my bike just went back a little bit. 
uh, secret favorite modes. So you see five second, seven second, 10 second, 15 second. Uh, minor problem with this drone does not support two or three second like some of the other ones do, just in my bell there. Uh, but what's cool about this though, is if you are trying to shoot perhaps yourself, and if regulations do allow you to put a controller down for a second, and you want to ride through the frame or run through the frame or do whatever you're doing, uh, get a family photo, this is great. So you just press this button and it's gonna take a photo every five seconds like you see on the screen right there. Uh, so I use this quite a bit actually uh, for getting action shots of myself where I just set the whole frame up uh, and then go through it. And again, you could just shoot video instead and that makes a lot of sense too, uh, but sometimes I really want the high resolution. If I'm gonna have that be like the banger of a photo, then I really want that high resolution of a photo compared to the video. And then lastly, there's the pano options. Uh, so if we go down on the right hand side, you'll see pano at the bottom there. Uh, and what pano is, is panorama. And you see there's a couple options, sphere, 360 degree sphere, pretty straightforward, 180 degrees, uh, pretty straightforward as well. It's got 180 degrees across in front of you. Uh, and then you got wide angle, uh, and then you have vertical. So to show you the 180 here, I'm just gonna turn it this way. This way, so we're facing the wind blow, of course. Uh, and I'll tap this. And it's gonna take a bunch of photos. You're seeing it automatically doing that right now. And then when it's done, it's gonna stitch those together. Uh, and then you'll be able to see all this on the SD card as well. And again, you can change the options at the bottom right there if you needed to, uh, to go ahead and do compensation or whatever you might wanna change on the photo settings. On the right-hand side, note that it shows the percentage uh, of that currently being done. So it's at 50% right now, and it needs to get to 100% to finish. Once it's 100%, then you can go ahead and do what you wanna do with the drone. From this point, 50 to 100% is actually the stitching of the photo versus the zero to 50% was the taking of the photos. Okay, that's all finished up right there. And we'll go back to into a normal photo mode here. And just to show you, like if this was me taking a photo of something, uh, first off, I'm gonna get off of the uh, timer. There we go. I'm gonna take a photo of this windmill. I'm gonna go to 3X. I'm gonna use the gimbal to rotate up a bit. I'm gonna rotate out so I get a little bit of the uh, canal there. There we go. Just like this. And that's kind of, well, roughly like a photo like this. Ah, perfect. So this is a low battery RTH. Uh, so what's gonna happen here in the next couple seconds is gonna automatically come back and fly to me. Uh, now, you can see, there we go. It's gonna fly back. Uh, RTH is again, return to home. And there's two ways that return to home will automatically trigger. The first is if the controller loses contact with the drone. You fly too far, whatever the case is, I throw this on the canal. Uh, in that case, the drone will detect after a little bit of time that it can't talk to the controller anymore, and it'll come back to me, and it'll land. Uh, so it's doing that now, uh, and it'll go ahead and it'll basically fly normally up to 100 meters. Uh, in this case, there was no reason to go to 100 meters to come back down again, so it's going to 24 meters. And we'll see how close it gets before I stop it at the very end here, so it doesn't uh, end up relatively close. You know, not exactly where I put it, but you know, in this case, it's pretty darn close. I'm gonna go ahead and move it just slightly backwards though. So I'm gonna use this to stick right here. There we go, a little back. And didn't quite go back fast enough, but uh, as you can see, no big deal that I hit the grass. Is it ideal? Nah, not really, <laughs> but uh, I'm not super worried about it. Uh, you can see on the props itself, there's no damage because it's just the grass. But if this back one here had hit, say, this rock or something like that, it would have a slight crack in it. Uh, you know, there we go, I'll put it right there instead. And we'll go ahead and swap batteries, but uh, no problems, I don't see any damage there at all. Nothing going on, uh, all good. So let's uh, do a quick battery swap -aroo. Change batteries, we just pull it out like this. I probably could have turned it off first, but I'm not super worried about it. And then we grab the next battery out of the pack here. Horses are watching us back there. Toss it in and then power it back on. There we go. Okay, you see that we have 12, 13 satellites. Now we go to HomePoint Updated. Now, what HomePoint Updated means, it's really important here, is it's telling me that it knows that this is the home point that it comes back to for the return to home. Um, if you don't have that home point, so past that 13 satellites, uh, then it won't know where to return to home. So if you were to fly away, it'll probably actually update the return to home like over the canal right there, which would be a bad place to land. Uh, so that's useful. You can always update if you want to after the fact. So I'm gonna show you that really quick before we go into the automated modes. First, I'm gonna take off. Uh, you can also take off by just holding these two sticks inwards and down. And I'm just gonna go up, there we go. And I'm gonna get off over to here. There we go. So just gonna put it out, not over the river, just in case I forget later on where it is or something goes wrong. It's gonna be in that farmer's field over there, which would be a pretty bad place to update the home point to, but I'm gonna show you how this works. So I tap the upper right hand button there and I go out of the menu customization from earlier on and I go back to safety 
and I find a home point. There we go, update home point there. Uh, so normally the safety and go down. You'll see update home point. And then this allows me to uh, put that home point where it is right now or to drag it to somewhere else. So I can say, you know what, I'm gonna put it on this side of the river over there and then click okay. Uh, now again, that's home useful if for some reason you've moved somewhere else. If you're on a boat, you're on a, uh, not a train, but some object where you're going somewhere, you can update the home point to your new location. All right, so with that all said, let's go ahead and talk about the three core automated modes, uh, which is quick shots, master shots, uh, and then we'll go into active track, hyperlapse, and waypoints. And quick shots are amazing for beginners because it lets you like get uh, amazing footage that makes you look like an advanced drone pilot. So I'm gonna fly forward over here, and we're gonna go check out this windmill. I'm just gonna do a quick look. I'm gonna increase my exposure comp uh, by a third just because I like that look a little bit better. Uh, now, what quick shots are is ways to automatically get, well, quick shots. So we're gonna tap this right hand button right there, and we're gonna go down and you'll see quick shots. And there's a number of core quick shot modes. You can see this one here, right there is droney. I uh, basically, as it's showing you on the screen, uh, you can see rocket. There we go, it's gonna go basically straight up. You can see circle, it's gonna circle around something. Uh, and remember, you can always speed the footage up later on as they're doing in some of these examples right here. Uh, there is the uh, helix, which goes up and circles at the same time. Uh, there is boomerang, uh, which as this shows right there, kind of boomerangs out and back in again. Uh, there is asteroid, which makes a sphere panorama thing. Use this sparingly, it looks cool like a couple times and then it kind of gets old. Uh, and those are the core modes. So I'm gonna show you for now, we're gonna do a droney on the uh, windmill, so I'm gonna get that out of the way. Uh, and the way this works, I can go ahead and just simply highlight this. Uh, there we go, so I just draw, I'm just drawing a circle around it, it's, or a square around it, sorry. Uh, and the distance I want, uh, I can choose 30, 40, 50, uh, 80, 100, et cetera meters. And uh, this is how far it's gonna go away. Uh, we'll do 50 meters away. And I'm gonna start a little bit closer, a little bit lower. There we go, like that. And I just press the start button. Three. And now it's just gonna fly its thing. I'm not gonna do anything, One. it's gonna do this. And when it's done, uh, it'll have that video saved. Uh, now in this mode, it will start and stop the video recording automatically. Uh, it will not do that in Active Track, which I'll show you a little later on. But uh, for all the quick shot modes, it's gonna go ahead and just record it automatically. Do double check that your resolution at the bottom is what you want it to be. Uh, by default, DJI will default to 1080p uh, the first time you open up the drone. So in this case, you can see I've changed it to 4K30, uh, but do go ahead and make sure you have it on whatever resolution you want. Otherwise, uh, you'll have kind of sad panda moments. And you see at the end, it'll return back to the same starting point. You can cancel that if you want to. If you're like, you know, I wanna go do something else, then just press the uh, red X there and it goes somewhere else. Uh, and again, we can choose a different one if we want to. So I can see circle right now. Again, I can just highlight this object like this. And then I can see, do I wanna to go to the right or the left around it? Uh, I will choose to go to the left just because, uh, and I will choose Three. the start, and then yeah. off it will go and record this whole thing. One. I won't make you sit through this entire thing. I'll just let you know it's gonna go around the circle and come back. Now, I'm gonna stop this here, and I'm gonna fly over instead to the windmill, and we're gonna talk about master shots. Uh, so, I'm gonna tap this upper right hand button, I'm gonna choose master shots, there we go. And get close to it, you see it's telling me to go draw a circle on that, that's fine, thank you for that information. Obviously it knows you wanna draw a circle around this, but it's just of course just where I happen to be. There we go, pull back a little bit, and we're gonna highlight this. I'm gonna explain what master shots is once I get going. Uh, and move that out of the way. And there's a couple options at the bottom. I have the width, the length, and the height. So if I tap on each one of these, I can adjust these, and notice it'll adjust the time. It was two minutes before, now it's 220. Uh, so a large width, um, and then length and the height. Uh, for height, we can go large as well. There we go, 240. And I've got my resolution set at 4K30, which is fine. And I'm gonna hit Three. start. Now. Walking back to the bike here as this goes, uh, it's gonna start in doing something. It's gonna take two minutes and 40 seconds to complete this master shots. Uh, and this is something where a lot of people, especially advanced flyers, don't understand the real value of master shots, which is not the pretty little 15 second video that it outputs at the end. So what master shots is ostensibly used for is that at the end of this whole thing, it'll give me this montage. You see it's shooting a bunch of different shots right now. It's basically like the greatest hits of this windmill. All these amazing automated shots, uh, it's doing that. And it's gonna stitch them all together into one 15 second with music and overlays and 
pretty things like that. Uh, what's super cool here is that, yes, it gives you that little exciting 15 minute second uh, video, but it also gives you two minutes and 40 seconds or however long you set here worth of footage. And you can see at the bottom, it's showing you doing a circle, close, circle, medium. It's showing you all these moves. This is basically like a B-roll expert going off and getting you roughly eight to 12 perfectly executed moves of B-roll of this windmill. There we go, two minutes and 29 seconds. Uh, and then from there, I will show you later on uh, back at the desk how we can get that into a Master Shots fancy video or do whatever the heck you want with it. Uh, so the last thing I wanna show you on this little section here is a spotlight mode. So I'm gonna go back to video uh, and I'm gonna choose the windmill itself. I'm just gonna highlight it again. Uh, and in the bottom, you see three options, actor track, spotlight, or POI. Active track means it's gonna actively follow me somewhere. I'm gonna show you that in live here in a second. Spotlight means it's gonna go ahead and hold on to this point, the camera itself. The camera is gonna stay focused on the windmill no matter where I fly. Uh, so I'm just gonna record for a second to show you this. And I'm just gonna hold the right. And you'll see the drone is going ahead and staying focused on that windmill. If I go up, the drone and the gimbal is staying focused on that windmill. If I go down, it's all staying focused. This is really useful, uh, whether it's a physical object like this or a person that is moving. Uh, because this way, if you had a friend that's on a bicycle or car or whatever the case is, use Spotlight, highlight that person, that object, and then go ahead and do your drone moves. The drone will one, keep you from hitting something using obstacle avoidance, uh, and two, it'll keep it focused in center screen on the object that you're shooting. It's an amazingly powerful feature that very few people use, which is too bad because it's, it's really, really useful to ensure you get shot Shots that aren't like constantly missing the subject the wrong way and all that kind of stuff. Likewise, there's POI. Uh, POI is what you expect here. Uh, again, I can circle the windmill. There we go. POI. And then I can press go. And you'll see it has uh, at the bottom there those two arrows going right or left. If I were to slide that arrow up, it'll go faster now. It'll move faster around the windmill here. Uh, but again, what's cool is you can use these while you're moving. Uh, so you can use these on a moving object, on a boat, on a uh, person, car, vehicle, whatever the heck it is. Uh, you can do that here, not just for POI. Now you may be asking, why would I use POI versus quick shots versus going around here? And the reason is in this mode, I can increase or decrease my altitude. So I can be like, you know what? I wanna go ahead and go down like this, slowly going down. It's not gonna look too fast to you, but uh, it is going down here slowly. Um, you can adjust that. I can say, I wanna go out further if I want to. I can pull the sticks back. I can go closer if I go forward here. Uh, so again, because the speed that we're going, it's not showing being super obvious to you, but uh, it is going ahead and doing that. I'm going down now. You can see it's clearly going down. Uh, so you can adjust those parameters in real time uh, as well as the speed, which you can't do in quick shots. Quick shots is just, it's 15 to 20 second thing. It's one and done versus this allows you to do a bit more freedom around this. Uh, and you can see it's slowly kind of getting a little bit offset here. Uh, not a big deal. I'm just going to kind of readjust that framing by hitting the left hand stick to adjust it back to the center there. Uh, and then I go ahead and stop and I'll hit stop on the recording as well, and it goes and stops in place. Okay, so next up we've got Actor Track, and I've rearranged the bike a little bit so I can show you this all in real time. Uh, now, the way Actor Track works, we're gonna select me as an object here first. I'm gonna get the bike out on the road. Ding dong, yep, didn't mean to do that, but I did. There we go. Uh, and I will talk about the bike, don't worry. Uh, I'm gonna get myself in the frame. What's cool is that you can use Actor Track on either the one by or the three by lens. The three by lens is amazing because it allows you to get the, the drone further away from things and be potentially in a safer environment. So the way this works, I just go ahead and select myself right there. Uh, and you can see it sees me as a, a person. Uh, automatically, it should do this as well. If it does not, the way you can do this is tap the dot, dot, dots in the corner there and turn on subject scanning. Got turned off, it looks like. There we go. Uh, and let's see if I just wave. There we go. Boom, found me. And this will go ahead and say, okay, that's a person there. And then I'll turn on actor track and I'm gonna stay to the right. Uh, so this basically says, do you wanna shoot from the right side, the front, uh, back, etc." I'm gonna say, choose the right. And you have to press go. You also have to press the recording button. I never understand why. Uh, now on this particular bike, I have not set up my uh, controller holder. So that's why the carabiner, so I can just clip it on there. Uh, but I do have an entire video on how to use the controllers on bikes on, you can use it for a motorcycle, regular bikes, any sort of mount situation you want. Uh, check that up in the corner there. But at this point, we just go, it's gonna follow me. So watch as we start pedaling here, put that on. Okay. And it'll start following along or not. Now, sometimes it's a little bit finicky. I may have been in the in the weeds there a bit. 
Uh, I prefer this to circle myself, to be honest. I find it works better. But, okay, fine. Go from the right. There we go. Press go. And let's see if it goes this time. Come on. There we go. So, now it's following us. And it's as simple as that. That is active track. Uh, but what's cool is that you can change the position as you see fit as you're going. Uh, so I can go ahead and I can also pull it out or back. Uh, so I can say, you know what, I want a bit more altitude. There we go. Increasing that out like that. And it's going to keep on following. Uh, and this bike, by the way, this is called an Urban Air. It's a cargo bike. I live in the Netherlands. Cargo bikes are incredibly common in the Netherlands. Uh, uh, don't always look like this, but uh, now you can see we just lost me there. And we will get rolling. I'm down in my lowest on my SD card here. Should have offloaded beforehand. And Active Track is struggling today. The struggle is real. Let's see if we can get this to work this time. Third time to charm. Or not. This is by far the uh, the worst it's ever done in all my tests. All my other tests were like lukewarm okay, but uh, here we go. Now it's behind me. It's usually the best place from a tracking standpoint. It tends to do the best there. Uh, and you can see it's following along. Uh, I could change the, the angle if I want to, so go ahead and do that. I just tap the middle and then tap the right-hand side. Uh, and off it will go to the right-hand side and try to follow me from the right automatically. There we go. See, now we're making progress. Now it's looking pretty good. It's, it's figured me out. And this is what's cool about Actortrack is you don't have to, to do this. You also don't have to take the real controller with you if your regulations allow. Uh, and you can use Actortrack with someone else as a, as a friend or whatever the case may be. Uh, and it'll follow and it will avoid obstacles. Well, hopefully anyways. And now here's the value of the 3X lens. I just did that on Selected Me. And keep in mind, I'm on the 3X lens. I'm not on the one by lens. Uh, so I'm probably not going to get the full windmill unless I were to lower down a bunch, which I could do. Lower down more. I get that in frame, but it's going to be a bit tough. Uh, and again, as I get closer to the ground, as I get closer to objects, it will go ahead and uh, slow down. So you can see, you hear the beep, 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 beep. That means it's getting close to an object, uh, which means it's going to slow down. Uh, but I want to get this windmill in the shot. See if I can round the corner here and we'll call this section done. Still tracking. Still tracking. Come on. Get some windmill. We need some windmill in the shot. Three, two, one. Windmill time. There we go. Okay, so next up we have hyperlapse. A uh, hyperlapse allows you to basically shoot a time lapse while moving somewhere. So we'll tap the film strip and we'll go to hyperlapse. There we go. So you see on the right hand side, there are a couple different options. Free, circle, course locked, waypoint. Uh, free means that I can control where I wanna go. Circle means it's gonna circle around something. Uh, course lock means it's gonna go ahead and maintain its course, which is generally what I use. Uh, and then waypoint means it's gonna have a set series of waypoints that follows along. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and do course lock here. There we go. I'm going to tap the bottom at the, there we go. And then uh, this will allow to go straight across this canal. Uh, and now you see the interval. There's two second interval. So how often is it going to take a photo that then stitches together into a time-lapse picture or time-lapse video? Uh, and then there's the length. That is how long I want my end video to take. Uh, so five seconds mean my end clip will be five seconds long. And then the speed. How fast do I want to go? There we go. Let's go a little bit faster, 5K an hour. I'm going to go a little more altitude here. I will now lock this direction by pressing that lock icon. Uh, and you see it'll take 4 minutes and 10 seconds to shoot this, 125 frames. I will hit the record button, and off it goes. It's as simple as that. Uh, you can hear it taking photos, and in 4 minutes and 6 seconds, it'll be done. Now, as we get to the end of the hyperlapse here, <clears throat> you'll see there's an option that says plus one S. Uh, this means that, hey, you know what? I want to keep on going. I want to add another one second of end state footage. Uh, I can do that by just tapping that plus one S. It'll go off and keep on going. Uh, I'm just going to let it end because I don't have a reason to need that much more footage. Uh, but that's useful if you're like, no, 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 I want just a little bit more. Just tap that right there. But obviously, this is cooler if you do it for longer with much more dynamic clouds, uh, sunset, things like that. Now, the next thing that's kind of similar to hyperlapse, but very, very different in terms of usage is waypoints. Uh, now, I'm going to go back to the normal video mode right there. Uh, and you'll see on the left-hand side, there's an option for a little squiggly uh, line there. And that's to plan a waypoint flight. What waypoints allows you to do is to go ahead and set 
places where the, the drone should be and which direction the camera should be pointed, altitude, all that kind of stuff. Not only that particular day over and over again, but perhaps over the course of a year or something like that, maybe capturing a construction project or seasons, whatever the case may be. Uh, so I'm gonna show you this very briefly here. I'm gonna go down, I'm gonna make kind of a, there's not a lot here to make a really exciting waypoint course for, uh, but I will do that nonetheless. I'm gonna bring the drone down. <clears throat> Just show you how this is gonna work. So we're gonna start off here, next to this tree over there. That seems like a good place. Uh, and you see it says to press the C1 button to add a waypoint. C1's on the back there. We'll go ahead and tap that once. There we go. Okay, and then I can go ahead and go forward. And we'll tap the next one. Uh, no, I'm actually shooting a tutorial on how to use it. So oh, okay. teach people how to use them. And this is a great place out in the middle of nowhere and enjoy, have a good one. So a very good example of just being super friendly. I left the drone over there in the field while I was shooting this. Uh, I had a quick talk just explaining what it was. Uh, they're interested, like no one's scared. I wasn't like trying to follow them or anything like that, just putting it over there. So I'm gonna get to the next C1 or next waypoint here, which I'm gonna put over the river. So I'm gonna put it uh, just over the river. I'm struggling to make this a really interesting shot. So I'm gonna put it right here over the river. There we go. And I'm gonna press another waypoint. Okay, so you see the bottom, it'll add the extra waypoint there. There we go. And then I'm gonna go down the river, like that. I'm gonna put another waypoint right here. Okay, and then I'm gonna go start to go up here, add another waypoint. Okay, and now I'm gonna kind of rotate upwards and out. So I'm gonna add a waypoint here. There we go. And go up a little higher and add one more up here. And I can control the gimbal too, right? So I can do this and go out a little ways. And it's gonna automatically go ahead and uh, smooth out all those shots in between them. So add one more right there, perfect. Uh, and then next I can go ahead and tap that uh, dot, dot, dot option to change things. So I want the global speed to be a heck of a lot faster. I can change which cameras I want. At the end of the flight, I can say, do you want to return to home um, or to stop there? What do I want to do if it loses signal? Uh, so if it loses signal, I can say, you know what? I want it to return to home, hover or land. Uh, and at the end of the flight, I can say hover, land. I'm just gonna tell it to hover. There we go. Then I will hit go. Uh, and now it's gonna go to the starting point first. So you can see it's gonna fly itself right to that starting point. Uh, now, one thing is by default, it will not automatically start recording unless I've either set that in the menu uh, or I've gone ahead and just pressed the recording button. So I'm just gonna do that now before I forget. Come on, there we go. Uh, so I don't forget to do that. There we go, so it's getting back to the same spot. Uh, now I would caution that <clears throat> Some of these spots aren't super precise, especially altitude. I've seen on the Air 3 in particular that it's, uh, precision on that isn't great. So you can see right now, it's like, oh, boom, object detected, waypoint flight is suspended. Uh, and this is where I try to get a little bit tricky, but I thought that was plenty of room between these things. Uh, it did not. So I'm gonna go to the next, uh, let's see, it's waypoint. We'll start at waypoint two instead. There we go. So we'll get to waypoint two. See if we'll go around it to get there. Come on. You can do it, fine. We'll just manually fly it around it. Um, and this is where you, you realistically have to have a bit more uh, flexibility in this. So there we go, waypoint two, we will start there. And there we're starting our, our um, entire journey and we'll let it do its thing and hopefully it won't kind of plunk into the river. Uh, you're gonna see me, there I am. Uh, and it's gonna go ahead and I think this is where waypoint two begins right there. Uh, you'll notice that the altitude, it's a bit high right now. I'm curious, we'll see if it'll lower down, hopefully not into the river itself. Uh, there we go. And again, I wouldn't necessarily recommend doing something over water for your first waypoint this close to the river, but I'm gonna give it a roll. So now it's cruising. It's moving pretty darn fast. Uh, you can see it's coming around the corner right here. All this is automated. I'm not, I'm not touching anything. It's doing it by itself, uh, recording it, and it's going to the third waypoint right now. Uh, let's see if it'll, hopefully it won't trip a low altitude warning here. There we go, now we're going up. Now it's starting the rotation. You can see it's starting to rotate automatically, uh, capturing that in there. Now it's gonna go through that fifth waypoint right there, boom, which is where that center that I wanted, showing the windmill. And it's gonna keep on rotating up and rotating towards the windmill because again, it's smoothing out all these moves in between each one of these waypoints. Uh, and at the ending in a couple seconds, and there we go. And that's automated. I can do that over and over and over again. Again, the world's your oyster there. Uh, and then when I'm done, I'm wanting to stop recording here. And then on the left-hand side, I can go ahead and tap those little squiggly lines. And I can say, do you want to save these waypoints for future use? Yep, save and exit. If I tap that squiggly line again, you can see on the left-hand side, there's that little list icon. Uh, if I just tap that, these are my, some of my past waypoints that I've saved here or waypoint flight plans. Uh, and then I can go ahead and fly them. Obviously you don't want to fly them if they're far away. 
so this one's you know 4k away etc uh, now i'm going to cancel this return to home and i'm going to show you sport mode uh, so let's get the waypoints out of the way here there we go we'll start recording because of course we will and the sport mode the way access sport mode is just toggle to the right keeping in mind in sport mode there is no obstacle avoidance at this point it will fly directly into something but we can go really fast so i'm going to show you how much faster we can go here we to about 70k an hour i'm going to go ahead and uh, buzz myself There we go. And this is where you can have some fun with approaches, getting down nice and low. And really kind of exposing this up slowly like this. For example, chasing a speedboat would be a good uh, scenario where you want that extra speed up to 70k an hour to go ahead and pull off that. Uh, and you don't have to worry about obstacle avoidance because of the fact that uh, you're out in the open ocean. Now you can hear the beeping, it means it's upset. I'm going through 15% battery. Uh, and if I were to ignore this, eventually it will force its landing uh, starting around the 10% marker. And um, if that happens, you can go ahead and use the up arrows, etc., or up joystick, sorry, uh, to go ahead and kind of minimize that to a degree, and you can change the direction, uh, but eventually it will forcibly land uh, for you, it will not just fall to the sky. I'm going to pull this down, and I'm going to show you uh, an important skill. So, the way you hand catch something is a really useful skill that I feel like everyone should know how to do. Uh, and I'll talk about why once I get a hand caught so we don't run out of battery. The first thing is you want to bring the drone down to right in front of you at shoulder level. So I'm going to bring it down here. There we go, just like that, okay? A little higher at shoulder level. And then all you're going to do is reach under, grab it, and flip it over. Uh, so I'm going to reach under, grab it, flip it over, and it shuts off automatically. Now, pretty cool battery. Now, the reason you want to go ahead and and catch is that the scenario might not be okay for you to land. Uh, for example, if you're on a boat, I would strongly recommend hand catching. If you're on the beach, hand catch so you don't get in the sand. If you're in snow, hand catch. Uh, windy environments, generally better to hand catch. There are two different ways you can hand catch something. The first one is you can allow it to land on your hand. You put your hand out and you land on it. Look, if it's a calm day, perhaps. But this way is just way safer. Uh, and no, it does not damage the props. That's an urban legend simply does not damage in any way, shape, or form. Uh, all you're doing is the second you turn it over, anytime a DJI drone is turned over like a turtle, uh, the props will shut off. Uh, there is no damage whatsoever there. I've talked with DJI about this many, many times. No problems at all. Uh, and this is by far the safest way. If it's very windy out, waiting for a drone to slowly go down your hands like this, you're gonna chop your hands, which these props will hurt, but they, they won't, they'll draw a little bit of blood maybe on your fingertip, uh, but they won't they won't do anything bad. It's just like a tiny paper cut of sorts uh, But hand catching is an incredibly useful skill that I feel like everyone should do because you never know where you want to land your drone somewhere that isn't suitable for it. The main thing people do that screws up the hand catch sometimes is they will go ahead and they'll put their hand out before the drone lands mm -mm. Let the drone come down to your shoulders Then reach under it and grab it. Do not reach under it until it's at your shoulders Otherwise the drone will actually fly up away because it detects an object there now, with that, we are finally ready to jump inside and look very briefly uh, at the app and some of the features there before wrapping things up. Now, once you want that footage, there are two options to get the footage off the drone. The first is to take the footage off of the SD card that's under this little rubber door right there. Uh, but in some cases, you may want it directly on your phone. And the fastest way to do that is Wi-Fi Direct, where it connects from your phone to the drone using Wi-Fi. And make sure the controller is off, otherwise this won't work at all. So if you tap the album button right there, in the upper right hand corner, there's that little lightning bolt option. Once you tap that, it'll go ahead and start searching for your drone. There we go, we can see it right there. If this is the very first time you paired your drone, it will ask you to double press this button just to simply confirm it, which is simply joining the Wi-Fi network of the drone. This is creating a direct connection between the drone and your phone to allow you to download higher resolution photos and videos. Tap view album and you'll see your album. Here you can go ahead and tap on something, you can play it, and you can choose what you want to download by just choosing this little download option in the lower right hand corner, and either do a full or a trim download if you just want a small slice of it. Now remember that master shots we created earlier on? You can see it has the master shots icon, that star with that you know, kind of Hollywood style clipboard there. Uh, in fact, each one of these clips has a small icon next to it indicating what sort of clip it is. If we tap that one there, you'll see that create master shots option. It needs to download the clip first. You can see the download status on the lower right hand corner right there, um, or back on the main gallery page while it's doing that. 
Generally speaking, it'll download about 30 megabytes per second. Now with that master shots footage downloaded, we can choose create master shots. And there's a bunch of templates here that you can choose uh, with different durations. So I can say epic uh, because this of course would be an epic window if we wanted to or city of pop or whatever the case may be. And there's music that comes with that as well. And obviously that's pretty, pretty epic stuff. Uh, from there, you go ahead and export it out. Uh, and this will export a video file for that particular template style. Uh, and it's really as simple as that. You can of course change a bunch of settings there if you'd like to. Uh, and this doesn't impact the raw files that are on the drone or on the SD card, that two minutes and 30 seconds or so of uh, footage that you can use for your own B-roll as you see fit. In addition, in the lower right hand corner, there's this create button right there. Uh, this will pull even more templates, basically different uh, options for going and editing your footage, um, or you can kind of manually pull that footage together or use that AI editor option there. That's kind of beyond the scope I wanted to do for today's video, uh, but this, you know, is kind of a starting point maybe for another video down the road. Okay, so there you go, a complete beginner's guide, complete guide, whatever the heck you want to call it for the Air 3. I also have a similar one for the uh, Mini 3 Pro up in the corner there and probably other ones for future DJI drones as well. Uh, definitely check those out. Again, if you found this video interesting or useful, go ahead and whack the like or subscribe button. It really does help out the video and the channel quite a bit.